Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being my friend and coming. It's nice, especially when there's all the, you know, the, the high-powered, you know, visiting guest speakers and everything are in the other place. Um, look, could I ask us to be able to congregate a little bit more into the center? Would that be possible? Would that not stretch our friendship too much too quickly, too early, too soon? Uh, just so that I know, I know, churches have split over these kinds of things, haven't they? Uh, but that would just help us to, because it's a big space and we want to be friendly. Thank you very much for your hospitality in that regard. Okay, my name is Sheridan Boise. I'm part of the Oxford Church. have been here for 12 years. Absolutely love it. Uh, and I find myself with a new calling in life. In fact, I look over the last 20 years of ministry and I can see three phases. And I've just entered this third phase and it was a very unexpected one. And it's all around this topic of friendship. I was going to write a book. And here we are starting a charity because things are just ramping up, because this need seems to be tapping into a, a vein that nobody else is tapping into. And churches are one of the two institutions in society left that actually can probably be the most impact, bring the most impact in society as a result of, uh, of this need. The other, other institution is sporting clubs. Churches and sporting clubs, the two remaining institutions that, according to the secular research, bring people from a variety of different backgrounds together regularly. Local mosque doesn't do that. A whole bunch of different places don't do that, but the local church does. And so when it comes to kind of reaching into this very great need of loneliness, well, we are incredibly well positioned. So can I just do a little bit of an advertisement uh, in then talking about this thing which is now turning out to be something called Friendship Lab. And if you go to friendshiplab.org, you'll be able to sign up for updates. And not only that, dear friends, as soon as you put your email address in there, you will get a little automatic email that will send you three tools that you can use straight away to deepen your friendships. So that might help you. This is going to be something that our primary kind of launch vehicle will be a course I've uh, got uh, researchers from left, right and centre coming out to help us with this, professors of psychology and education, got anthropologists, all going into creating what will be an evidence-based course to help us make and flourish friendship in this lonely age. This will be the alpha course for friendships. And churches will be one of the main ways in which we can bring people together from the community, as well as in church, by the way, who are wrestling with this, to connect at a deeper level. Right, so, you may know this face. This is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In September 2020, she died after serving 27 years on the US Supreme Court. She was only the second woman to have served in that position in the history of the US Supreme Court. She was a really interesting character. She's become a hero to many. She was Jewish, she was progressive, she was a hero to the progressive left. Her chief sparring partner in the Supreme Court was this guy, Justice Antonin Scalia. And he was in many ways her polar opposite. Female, male, she was Jewish, he was Catholic, uh, she, uh, he was uh, Italian as well, and he was hardly a progressive, he was actually conservative. She was a hero of the progressive left, and she, he was a hero of the progressive right, if you like. He was the conservative while she was a the progressive. They did not have very much in common. They were known for their spirited debates, read arguments. <laughs> they very rarely voted the same way on anything. They were known to be directly opposed to each other. And yet, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, this photo of them emerged. And no, it's not a photo for Indian tourism. That is a photo of one of many joint family holidays they took. Turned out that Scalia, most nights, would call through to Ginsburg's phone number, particularly late at night, to see if she was still working. And if she was still working, she'd say, come on, it's time for you to go home. Go home. You're working too hard. Go home. Have a nice warm bath. You need to relax. He would buy her roses on her birthday every year. When Ginsburg's husband, Martin, died, Scalia wept. When Scalia died, Ginsburg gave the eulogy. 
They went to the opera together. They enjoyed souvenir shopping together. They even spent every New Year's Eve together going back to 1980. Now, when this photo emerged, the media went into a frenzy. Social media blew up. Twitter loved it. Media outlets loved it because it seemed to give us a glimmer of hope in what had become very divided times. This is September 2020. Remember, after what happened in 2016 in the United States and what has seemed to have happened around the world in the last kind of five, six, seven years, suddenly we were seeing two people who normally should be absolutely at each other's throats doing joint family holidays to India together? What power could bring these diametrically opposed people together? The power of friendship. And I think that that image focused us so much, and I think that it resonated so much because we all know, we can all feel that there is something greatly missing in our lives, and that is that kind of deep connection, even beyond the political disagreements and the cultural disagreements and even theological disagreements that we can have. So in this session, I would like us to explore this friendship relationship. As I mentioned before, it's probably the most overlooked relationship we have. Uh, I want to tease it out a little bit because I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that here we are, we've just had a wonderful session on church planting, had these wonderful sessions this morning talking about expansion and the kingdom of God reaching into every corner of the globe and every little crevice of, uh, of our shire, and yet uh, I'm very conscious, I don't want this to sound like it's talking about friendship evangelism. Because friendship evangelism, there's a place for that, but friendship evangelism can sometimes throw means and ends around so that then we're kind of using friendship in order to evangelize. I want to just tease that out a little bit. We'll evangelize, but it's actually the other way around because we want the very best for our friend, and the friendship actually is a good end in itself. Does that make sense? So here we are. So we're starting off, we're talking about this wonderful, wonderful relationship, the most forgotten, the most ignored, the most overlooked, and yet there is a huge problem, and that problem is that friendship is in decline everywhere. According to two YouGov polls, around about 20% of the British population have no close friends. 20%. 7 to 10% of them have no friends at all. And this is echoed throughout the Western world. In Italy, 1 in 10 people have no friends. In Australia, 30% are not part of a friendship group. In terms of loneliness, 25%, one in four, say that they have no one to turn to or talk to. This is Australia. Australia's friendly. Take it from me, mate. <laughs> America, the amount of people who say they have no friends has quadrupled since 1990. So all of this has been building for a long time. We've got this huge loneliness epidemic and it doesn't seem to be going away. It's going to be here for quite a while. So why do we have that problem, especially when it is such a key relationship, not only for our relationships, but actually also for our well-being? Robin Dunbar, one of the world's leading researchers when it comes to friendship, says exactly this. Friendship is the single most important factor influencing our health, well-being, and happiness. He says, look, if you want, you can give up smoking, you can eat really, really bad food, you can eat the, have the most unhealthy lifestyle as possible, but if you've still got good friendships, you'll still probably be okay. It's that powerful. So what is the problem? Why do we have such a problem of friendship in this present time? That's what I'd like you to talk to the person next to you, just for two minutes. What do you see as the barriers for making new friends in this day and age, in this moment? What do you think are the barriers coming against it, the forces that are driving us apart rather than bringing us together? I'll give you two minutes, talk to the person next to you, and then you can give me your answers in just a second.
Okay, 20 seconds. Okay, what did you come up with? Shout it out from where you are. We were originally going to be in a smaller space, so you're going to have to shout a little bit higher. But shout it out. What did you come up with? Sorry? Shyness. Shyness. Yep. Busyness. Busyness. Time. Time. Related to busyness, I guess. Technology. Technology in what way? Real three-dimensional people who smell as well as look good. <laughs> right? Thank you. Good. Being vulnerable. Being vulnerable. And kind of the fear of being vulnerable, perhaps. Fear of being known, perhaps. Yep, that's good. Fear of con con catching contamination. Or, right? Yep. Yes, lack of opportunity. Right, less gatherings like this, actually in the same room, three-dimensional people, not pixelated, two-dimensional people. Yeah. Right, it was almost like, you know, what do they say? Three months to learn a new habit. We had two years of interrupted relationships. It would make sense that we've actually kind of gotten out of the habit of a few things, wouldn't it? Anything else? That's a pretty good list. Fear of being hurt, great one. You'll see that that's going to come up fairly quickly. Mobility. How many of you are still living in the town or city, i.e. around where we, where we are now, uh, that you were born in? Two hands. Two hands, maybe a third. Okay. A few of you are hedging a bit both ways. How many of you have moved once, or in, move, yeah, move, moved one to two times? What about three to four times? F four, five, six times? I'm um, we're talking way back. We're talking way back. So, you're like, right? Okay. So for me, it's I, I've lost count of the amount of cities or towns that I've lived in. Five major cities, two countries. So yeah, mobility, a huge one. Anything else? I was going up the list. Ten, ti ten times. That's right. Yeah, you were saying beforehand. Okay. Right. Gosh, and hasn't that just, it's always been there, but hasn't that erupted in the last six years in particular? Yeah, really good one. It's, it's a paradox, isn't it? We've been talked so much about difference, about recognising how it's really good to be different. And yes, maybe it's a slightly different one. It's, it's yes, you have, we have to agree unless, and if we don't agree, then we can't be friends. Yeah, well, we've already had one example of a secular example of which that actually doesn't need to hold sway. Really good answers, really good responses. So we just recently did a Friendship Lab survey. Some of you actually might have uh, filled that out. Thank you very much. About 950 responses so far, which has been really, really good. This is what we found that came out. The question was, in your experience, what is the biggest barriers to making new friends? And look what came out as number one. My own lack of time or energy. After that, other people's lack of time or energy. You might be available, they may not be. So the two biggest ones relate down to, I think the second person that spoke was business. Finding people I have things in common with, or commonality, homophily is the kind of key word there. Shyness, thank you very much for raising that one. My lack of trust in others due to past hurt, that came out as well. People don't reciprocate my invitations. My fear of having an invitation to meet up rejected. We asked a second and related question, which was, what are the biggest barriers to maintaining your friendships once you've got them? What comes first? And look how much 
ahead it is. And then staying close when we live in different cities, because why? We've all moved multiple times, some of us ten times in our lifetime. Look how small managing religious or theological differences is. Now, that's with this particular... There would be a a natural self-selection in the group that is the 950, so that might reflect who has filled out this particular form. But it's compared to the others, it's really quite small. Resolving general disagreements, managing political differences, managing cultural differences. But one of the other things that came out, I don't have it on a graph there, is the amount of people who said that their friendships had drifted because they had never actually addressed the issue that had come up between them. Friendship is a different kind of relationship. Unlike marriage, there is no kind of public commitment that binds us together. Unlike a business relationship where you've actually got a a contract where you sign that kind of keeps you together, friendship, one of its very qualities, which is also its downside, is it's entirely voluntary. We we, We voluntarily meet. You cannot force a friendship to happen. But we also voluntarily stay together as well. And then when something comes up, sometimes we then just drift away, particularly in British culture. We drift away rather than actually address that thing. You know when you said that, it just, I, I felt a bit hurt. And so the amount of people that want to learn actually how to address conflicts and difficulties or just raise difficult things and have those in a, in a, in a, in a good, healthy conversation uh, is really quite huge. So when you bring it all down with other research that's out there, you've all come down to the most important ones. The top one always is busyness. The second one is mobility. The third is shyness. Fourth is lack of trust. I'd like to add number five, and that is neglect. There is no relationship that has been more overlooked in our history than friendship. There is something so scintillating and tantalizing about the other relationships that seem to then suck all the oxygen out of the conversation for anything else apart from those. So let me talk very briefly about, for many of you church leaders, you already know these three Greek words, eros, agape, and philia. Eros is, yell it out, sexual love, let's call it romance. Agape is, come on preachers, the sacrificial, self-giving love which we see particularly manifested on the cross by Jesus. And philia is the Greek word for friendship. Can I suggest to you that these three words have been in tension, they've been in... They've had kind of wars happening between them over the last few centuries. Can I suggest to you that in our culture, philia gets pushed out by eros? Would that make sense? Just look through your Spotify playlist to prove me wrong. And I charge you to find one song about friendship on your Spotify playlist. Just one. If you find one, tell me what it is. Oh, you've got it. You've Got a Friend by Carole King. Right, one of about a dozen that's been recorded in the last 50 years. (laughs) This week, a special date is coming up in the diary. What is it? Men. Notice. (laughs) It was the ladies who actually said that. What is the date of Valentine's Day? Shout it out. That's so true. That's so true. What is the date of International Friendship Day? Shout it out. (laughs) Hello. Hello. My long lost brother. How do you know that? Nobody knows that. (laughs) Wild guess. 29th of July, that we actually have. Uh, what did he say? Oh, well, just get out. Let you go. Go on. <laughs> Completely led me down the wrong path there. So, we have had Philia be pushed out by Eros. I mean, just all the TV programs, everything. It's always, everything ultimately leads to some sort of romance in the end, right? Or some sort of sexual tension or whatever. We don't actually have a lot of popular culture that really focuses on friendship alone. This is a great shame. We have sex ed in schools, we have very little friendship ed, we have newspaper columns that are talking about dating, we have very few, actually none, uh, columns in newspapers talking about friendship. I really want to see that change. I really want to see that change. Even in the church, we have had books and courses, we've had whole ministries galore around dating, and marriage, and family. And I thank God for every single one of them. I really do. Name me one. 
around friendship. And that's why I'm hoping Friendship Lab is going to succeed. Which leads to the second one. In church, friendship has often been pushed out by agape. And why not? Agape, that most amazing, sacrificial, self-giving love, it doesn't look for anything beautiful in the person before it gives to that person. It's the most amazing of loves. It's demonstrated in the cross. It brings tears to our eyes. No wonder we always preach about agape love. And I bet you've probably had so many sermons over your Christian life where you've heard about agape love. And in fact, I reckon you've probably given them. And if you haven't, that's a problem. The good thing is it's an amazing Christian gospel thing, sacrificial, holy, a love that doesn't require anything in return gives anyway. It's just a beautiful kind of love. But if we've always focused on that, what happens tends to happen is then we seem to think that the only way to be Christians is actually to live sacrificially and live to serve the needy and serve the poor and serve the unreached. Yes, 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 and more. What about friendship? Oh, that kind of happens as you're doing that. Actually, no, I'm speaking to too many pastors for whom they do not have friends. I speak to too many people in church for whom they do not have friends. I speak to too many people who are even leading small groups for whom they just don't have friendships. We sometimes have let go of that wonderful thing called philia ourselves. And you know what? This is really worthwhile us just camping on just for a couple of minutes. I don't want to spend too much time on this. But some have raised big questions about friendship. Soren Kierkegaard, the 19th century Christian philosopher, being probably the ultimate one, he actually said friendship was not a New Testament idea. The New Testament idea was agape, self-sacrificial love. You give to those even if you don't give, get anything back. Friendship by its very nature is, number one, preferential. Somehow there's something about you that I just like so much, and so I do pick you out out of others, and you pick me out out of others. That sounds like it's not a very gospel thing because we love everybody indiscriminately. And also, friendship is not friendship unless there is some reciprocity. It's not just about me being friendly to you. If you don't reciprocate, I'm being friendly to you, but we don't have a friendship. Does that make sense? Now, we'll explore this a little bit more. You start with agape. You lead with agape. But I actually think friendship, philia, is where God wants to lead us all to, ultimately. A lot of people point to this verse, Matthew 5, 47, 46 to 47, where Jesus says, if you only love those who love you back, what reward will you get? And so Kierkegaard said, well, there you go. There's the verse. Friendship requires something in return, but you're not supposed to do that. So I want you to turn to the person next to you, perhaps the other person, point in another direction. I want you to talk for two minutes. You might want to look up the context. You might want to even look at it in concert with one of these other verses. We're not going to spend too long on this. But this is really important because if we subtly believe that friendship is either selfish, which he said it was, idolatrous, which is what he said it was, or at the very least, some sort of indulgence, we're not going to have the right footing in which to build our own friendships, let alone to offer some solutions to the world that is very, very lonely. So two minutes, starting now. What do you think? Does Matthew 5 cut friendship down at the beginning? It's time, time starts now.
give you 30 more seconds. Okay. This is probably a really lead answer, isn't it? Because you kind of know <laughs> where I'm leading on this. Hey, who's Sheridan Boise to go up against Soren Kierkegaard, right? So, hey, I could be wrong. But tell me, where did you come to? Does Matthew 5 say no to friendship that is reciprocal and preferential of one other person? Very good answer. Shall we move on? <laughs> Okay, how did you get to that point? Right. Right. It's in the context of enemy love. And that's the most amazing thing about agape. It even loves enemies. It doesn't require something back. It gives anyway. It's the most amazing gospel love. But it doesn't mean that we can't have filia as well. Anybody else? Anything on this side? Holy Spirit is working over this side, but not on this side. Okay. Well, you've got somebody up the back here. Nobody on this side at all. Okay. Maybe this will inspire. All right. Share your wisdom. Only. If you only love those who love you back. Great. Great. If we only live by reciprocity, um, actually then taking it to the nth degree, it becomes a business relationship. Because then it says, well, okay, I bought the coffee last time, you need to buy the coffee this time, and then, you know, oh, we're keeping a little tab, which one, when it, did, would he pay? Yes, he paid, he paid, he paid, I have to pay. Oh. That's, not, that's not filia either. Filia allows for lots of breadth of giving and it being mutual in all sorts of different ways. It's not kind of one-for-one, tit-for-tat kind of reciprocity, but it is, you're committed to me as much as I'm committed to you, and I'm committed to you as much as you're committed to me. Okay. Good. It's worthwhile exploring because you would be surprised that actually this is here in the back of many of our minds. It was in the back of my mind. I was born in Australia to English parents. I had an accent because I was born in Australia to, ac- to, to English parents. I was beat up in the schoolyard because I had an English accent. Thank you very much. And then I come here and you lot think that I sound like a South African. That is not fair. (laughs) But I was the kid who was always on the outer in primary school. I was the one who, you know, during the lunchtime, I was kind of walking around in circles to kind of make it look like I was really busy moving from this place to the other because I didn't have a group to land on. Things got better for me in high school, and then I became a Christian at the age of 18. And I think that both Scripture and the Holy Spirit took that experience and gave me a real heart for people on the edge. People on the outer, and I always wanted to then bring those people on the outer in. It was my friend Belinda and I in our church, uh, and there was the kind of cool youth group, and we didn't quite fit into that, but we kind of gathered up all the strays. And so in the end, we had this huge group, right? We were trying to make sure it wasn't a com- you know, competing group, but you know, all the strays were coming to us, and, and that it just felt like it was a real God thing. And it was, but it was unbalanced. And so by the time that we kind of I reached my early 30s, my wife at one stage said, look at all the people that we have in our life. They're all people you're trying to help. Because a little seed, a little thought, a little belief had slipped in that friendship, because it's reciprocal, and I didn't have the words for that yet, but because it seeks something back, because it's nice and friendly and warm, no, I've heard too many sermons about us not being a holy clique and going out and reaching the unreached and the unloved and the uncared for and the ones on the edge. Keep on doing that. Don't spend time on the people who are friends. And my wife had to raise that issue with me when I was in my early 30s. And then in 2008, uh, we were sitting in a fostering and adoption seminar and the tough-talking Sydney seminar leader, she said, look, if you go through with this, there's about 15 of us in the, in the room. If you go through with this, it's going to be very, very difficult. You're going to need some support around you. Who can you call at 2 a.m. when everything has gone wrong? And the pen hovered above the paper for some time because I wasn't sure who to write down into the little spot. And that's when I started getting intentional because I realized I was not being intentional. 
I'd only been in Sydney, that happened in Sydney, only been in Sydney for two years. We'd had six years in Perth and Western Australia, 26 years in Brisbane. I wasn't being intentional about the friends that I had in those cities. I wasn't being intentional about making new ones. So that was my awakening. Sheridan, you are really neglecting this. You are really neglecting this. Friendship is a holy calling. It is a holy calling. To have a friend is a holy trust. To be a friend is a holy calling. Right, so that's the theory. The second half of this seminar, I then want to explore on the practical. That's what Andy was really keen and the team are really keen for us to explore. It's going to be a six-session Friendship Lab course all on this, and I was really wrestling. How much of this can I squeeze into the second half of this seminar? I'm hoping that then we can just kind of focus on some key ideas as to how all of this can be done. But we need to get a definition, because if we don't get the definition right, then we're going to, again, be blown off course. Because friend can mean anything, can't it? We call reaching out to other people, befriending we call a Facebook friend, you know, who might be somebody we met at a colleague's birthday party through their daughter's best friend's puppy, Walker, and we met them for five minutes, didn't particularly like them at the time, but we're still Facebook friends with them five years later, and that's called a friend. There's all sorts of lovely, touching stories on the internet about grandmothers becoming friends with toddlers and, and uh, celebrity sports stars being friends with children in need. It's all very lovely. None of that is friendship. So we need a definition. And at this point, I'm very tempted to quote the old Jim Hayes joke, a friend is someone who helps you move house, a best friend is somebody who helps you move a body. <laughs> or to paraphrase Groucho Marx, a friend is someone who visits you in jail, a good friend is someone who bails you out, a best friend is someone who turns to you in the cell and says, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so at Friendship Lab, we're going to work on this definition, taking this from William Rawlins and expanded it to make it a little bit more Christian. You'll see where. A friend is someone I can talk to, depend on, grow with, and enjoy. And each one of those is really important. Someone I can talk to about the little things and the large things, the football scores and whether I should move jobs or whatever to my deepest, darkest secrets. Someone we can depend on. They're the 2 a.m. friends we can call when everything has gone wrong. Or they're the people we can depend on just to simply help us move house. The people we grow with, this is the one that I've kind of slotted in. To keep it in, in line with the great tradition of friendship that started way back, Plato and Aristotle, that has had the most transformative um, change as a result of theologians, actually, St. Ulred and others who have come along and really changed the way we understand friendship throughout the centuries. The Bible talks so much about iron sharpening iron and wonderful, rich friendships between Jonathan and David and others. And we have wonderful opportunities to grow. A friend helps you become the person you're supposed to be, helps you to make that extra change every day to become more and more like the image of Christ. They're the ones who can affirm us when we need affirming and call us out when we need to be called out. Those are the kinds of people who help us grow and enjoy. Friendship is by its nature. It's got laughter involved. It's got warmth. It's got some sort of friendliness that we just, we like spending time with that person, whether it's because they make us laugh or because they always give us some insights, they change the way we look at things, or because, like me, somehow you've just also developed a love for really weird, quirky, dark European films where everybody dies at the end, but they die so meaningfully. <laughs> there is something about enjoyment with friendship, someone to talk to, depend on, to grow with and enjoy, and all of this is mutual. Again, I can be friendly to you, you can be friendly to me, but unless we reciprocate, we don't have a friendship, we don't actually have the relationship. Right, so how does it form? Five stages. You start off at the acquaintance level, and this is where they talk about role-limited interaction. So you might be perhaps at work and, you know, you're just uh, relating to the receptionist perhaps, just in your own roles, or maybe it's the person on finance, and just simply because you have to, you have that conversation. But then one day, you actually move to friendly relations, which is where you actually start talking at, in the lunchroom and you have casual conversation. You say, oh, how's your weekend? What did you get up to? You are looking for commonality. And this is why don't let anybody ever tell you that small talk is bad. 
Small talk is a gift. Small talk is there to help build a bond. Now, it's no good if you st stay at small talk, you want to move to medium and big talk, but small talk is actually there to help you just kind of find out who a person is. Do that for a little bit more and you'll start moving into nascent friendship. Notice we haven't got to friendship yet. Nascent friendship, and that's where you might meet outside of your role context. If you meet somebody at church and you only ever speak to them at church, that's lovely. The next stage is for you to have a co coffee together or maybe have a meal together in one of your homes or to go and do something, see a movie, get a meal, something like that. This is particularly big for men and workplaces. I spoke to a very high-ranking professional who had just recently retired. After all the success in his field, and he says, you know, I'm now realising, I thought I had friends all this time. I've actually always had colleagues. There is a difference. A colleague can become a friend, but you have to move out of that context and start developing it. You start to increasingly self-disclose, share more about yourself with them and them with you. Then you could start moving into friendship. And this is where... You might start having a regular time together. You know, I really enjoyed that time. Do you want to meet up every Friday night and let's play a game of tennis or something like that? Something that you found in common. Let's go to that quirky little cinema and see those strange little European films, Sheridan. Keep on doing that and then you meet, kind of go just further and further deeper, closer, best, intimate friendship where your support and your trust is proven. Maybe you've gone through a 2 a.m. moment. You've been at A&E and they were there. Maybe you have shared some stuff with them and they have never told anybody. Maybe they've told things to you and you have kept that confidence. It's been proven. There is also a sixth stage, and it's worthwhile noting, waning friendship. And this is where maybe you've just simply lost touch. Very rarely is it a rip, a rip in the relationship because of some sort of big argument. Very rarely. Generally, it's a drift. And then you make the decision, well, do I reinvigorate it or let it go? So I've got a question for you. If you need more friends, based on this model, where do you think is the most strategic places to look, first and foremost? Yell it out. Based on this model, where would you... Uh, give me a number. You're thinking acquaintance? Who would already... Have, you have invested a bit of time into already. Colleagues, yeah, okay, what about the model? Whereabouts on there would you? Okay, let me jump, let me jump to it, time is running out. You, you want to start at number two, friendly relations, that's good. You know where I would start? I would start at number six. Because number six, you've actually probably got a real history with that person already. And if you've just drifted apart, you actually might be able to reinvigorate that quite quickly. Have you ever met? You were just talking just before about the fact you've met 40 years, was it? Re renewed a relationship from 40 years ago, and you've got all of that history to, to kind of jump back into, and it's amazing how you ever met somebody you haven't seen for a while and just go, ah, oh, felt like it was just yesterday. So that can be a really good place to start. After number six, I would actually go to number three. Anybody you've already developed some degree of connection with, and I'd start to invest from there, and that from that point I'd go backwards. I'd then go to number two, and then to number one, and if there's nobody around, that's when I think I would start then looking at starting completely new friendships by starting joining a group or something like that. But before we kind of jump into joining a new group or trying to find a cycling club or whatever it might be, there's normally some other options that we can start with. Does that make sense? Any questions before we move any further on that point? Yes. So it's like with the survey where the second one was keeping in touch and keeping close with people who are now living geographically distant. We live in the most amazing age when it comes to that because we have really quite rich media options now. My, three of my closest, maybe even still my closest friends are all in Australia. And we keep that friendship alive through monthly, we actually have made it regular, look at the model, <laughs> monthly Zoom calls and Skype calls, as well as then the occasional email and just checking in. 
uh, texts, WhatsApps, things like that. Just so the, the combination of checking in and having uh, regular conversations. Uh, used to be phone calls, and of course now we can actually see your face as well. It's not as good as being three dimensions who smell in the same room as we were talking about before, but gosh, it's good. And I relied on that when we first moved here, because no matter how wonderful a church you join, um, when you come to a new place, it's, it, it, you've got to start from scratch. Here's the research. Minimum of 50 hours to move somebody from acquaintance to friendship. And that's just the beginning of friendship. That's just basic friendship. In terms of moving from four to five and going down the levels, up to 200 hours. Now, if we work on an hour per coffee chat, that's a lot of time. You can accelerate it. There are some intentional environments you can create, and we'll talk about those in a second if I don't go too far over time, about how we can do it even as churches, by we can accelerate that. But that's still a lot of time. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, so that's how a friendship develops. And now here comes the rocket science. Friends, if you want to move people along that, here are the three things. Now, I'm going to get really technical, and you might just have to listen very, very carefully. Here are the three ingredients. The technical words are coming. Time, talk, and activities. I know. Rocket science. PhDs have been done on this. That's what they've come up with. Time, talk, and activities. So let us look at each one of those in, in time and turn and look at some of the commitments that we need to make. Number one, can I ask you to see friendship as a sacred calling? And that's where our first part has been trying to get you to the point of recognizing this is a sacred calling. There are many scriptures I could take you to, many passages. If you want to look at Jesus' friendships, I would suggest you actually look beyond the disciples. We tend to go Peter, James, and John. You're absolutely right. We'll go the rest of the 12 disciples. You're absolutely right. What about the 72 we were talking about this morning? You're absolutely right. If you want to see Jesus' friends that are actually outside of his work environment, quote-unquote, go to Luke 10, go to John 11 and 12, and there you will find Jesus relating to three people, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They're not part of the 12, they're not part of the 72, and yet listen to the language that Mary and Martha in particular used to Jesus. Jesus, if you'd just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. That's language of disappointment that you don't actually say to a Lord as such. Jesus, why don't you just say something to my sister to get her to help me with the stuff that we're doing? This is actually the conversation of friendship. This is, go and read John 11 when Jesus hears about Lazarus dying and he says, our friend Lazarus. It doesn't say that of anybody else. It says that Jesus loved Lazarus. The one that you love, Mary and Martha don't even need to mention Lazarus's name when the message goes to Jesus in the first place. The one you love has fallen sick. The one you love. That's said a very rare, very small amount of people. The Apostle John is the other one. And this time it actually comes from people who actually can claim that title. Go and look at that. Then you'll see some real relationships happening between Jesus and other people. But John 15, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Because a servant doesn't share this stuff with other people. But I have self-disclosed. I have shared everything that the Father has given me. I've given it to you. Self-disclosure. Jesus raises us up to friends. He brings himself down into our level. Jesus gives us then a calling. He says, love others if I have loved you. So friendship is a sacred calling, and Jesus wants that calling to be shared. It's a sacred trust. Practice friendship and prioritize it in your diary. Yes, we're all very busy. Yes, we all have lots of things on in our lives. But with Ofcom telling us the average time spent watching TV and streaming video alone, before we talk about radio, podcasts, or scrolling Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all the rest, Video alone, how many hours per day do you think Ofcom says? 2022 figures, the latest figures. What do you think it is per day? Shout it out, what do you think? Four, Four hours per day? Do I hear more? Eight? Do I hear anybody else? It's five hours, 16 minutes per day of video and TV alone. 
And so I would like to suggest that if you have time for Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, Netflix, iPlayer, Disney Plus, and Amazon Prime, YouTube Shorts, Instagram Stories, Reels, and LinkedIn videos, if you can watch the whole season of Strictly, binge watch The Crown, and watch reruns of Big Bang Theory, I think you've got time for friends. <laughs> Especially when we talk about the short amount of time that it takes to maintain our friendships. Plan ahead. Maybe you have a particular night or a particular day where you kind of, that's your time you're going to plan your friendship time. I did this on Sunday night. I had a few people that I just hadn't contacted for a while, so I sent them kind of three different forms of communication, which we'll talk about in a second. And uh, it's just a way of being able to keep in touch with these kinds of people that we want to maintain our friendships with. And then the second thing, you want to respond when they initiate. The amount of people who don't respond when somebody does actually text them and say, hey, do you want to get together? And use social media to bring uh, you two together in the room. So somebody raised social media. The research on social media is actually really mixed. Some of, us, some of it suggests that it helps us to stay in touch, that drip feed of information you know, from our friends that we can kind of keep in touch with. Friendship is, uh, Facebook in particular is a, a great cheat sheet. If you're going to meet somebody, you just go through Facebook and just see what they've been up to, and so you can have something to talk about when you get there. Uh, but we also know that there's a heap of research saying that it's terrible for mental health, terrible for comparison, all of the rest. Where it does say it's good is when you use social media to bring you together in the room. So you can actually use it in that way, then you'll be in uh, good, healthy grounds. And then be the initiator. Friendship does not organically happen. That stopped when we left university. The golden years of friendship in terms of making it really easy, of it being organic as high school and university. Once we leave, once we graduate, that's done. Because what happens? You go off, maybe you get married, you go off, maybe you move cities to go to another job or something like that, and before you know it, we're actually away. We have to be intentional. Be the initiator. I want to give you three ways that you can do that. Number one, the check-in note. This can be by WhatsApp, Messenger, text. It can be by... Snail mail, it can be anything like that, but this is a short little note that might say, like I did on Sunday night to one of my friends, hey mate, just checking in to see how you're feeling now. This is a friend who had been off sick for a while, was finally back at work after months of being off. Oh, that's all it needed. We'd had a phone call, you know, a little while ago. That's all it needed, a quick check-in note. That'll take you all of maybe 30 seconds. I reckon 30 seconds out of your five hours is worth it. Then there's the catch-up call. Hey, mate, a quick call for no other reason. I just want to see how you're doing. I did that on Sunday night. Well, I nearly did it on Sunday night. It was 7.30, and I was about to call, and I realized, actually, he's got three little girls that are all under the age of nine, and I thought, probably around about now, 7.30, Sunday night, they're probably doing meals or getting little kids to bed and stuff. That's what you parents do, apparently. And so I just dropped him a message and I said, hey, I was just about to call you just to see how you're doing. Uh, but, you know, I realise, you know, men might not be the best time. You've got time tonight. Anyway, let's call. Let's, let's talk. And he did. And we had an hour's conversation and it was great fun. Just to see how you are. What has happened with our country and phone calls? We don't seem to do as many phone calls anymore. And then there is the meetup. Now, here's what you don't do when it comes to the meetup. And this has turned out to be a key bit of hack for you. So you take one thing away that's practical, this might help you. What do we typically say? Ah, oh, love to get together with you at some stage. We really should hang out. We should really get together. And where does that go? <laughs> so how about something that's a little bit more specific, a little bit more like this? Hey mate, I found this amazing pizza place that does a two for one deal on Monday nights. I'd love to share one with you and catch up. Are you free this Monday or next at, say, 7 p.m.? <laughs> I wasn't sending it to you. <laughs> but see... Yeah? Okay. You know what? You don't have to copy and paste this and use it word for word. You can adapt this if you like. You can do it in two months' time if you like. But, but play with me here. What do you think that that has that the typical we should get together doesn't? Times, dates, specific place. What else does it express? 
desire, genuineness. I would love to have that pizza with you. <laughs> so, if you work on something along those lines, it might be two months. We're away for the next two months. I know this is crazy, but how are you looking at October? Or something. But do it specifically. Well, what happens? It allows a person to say, no, actually, no, I can't do this Monday. I can do Tuesday. I can do next week. I can do something in three weeks' time. 7 p.m. is not going to work because of the kids. But how about we do Saturday afternoon? And then you've got a conversation happening, and you're going to get something in the diary. That makes sense? So, three ways to be the initiator. Number two, talk. Develop a genuine interest in others. Other people are image bearers of the invisible, profoundly amazing God. They contain wonders. They are universes of experiences and stories and hurts and lessons learnt from all their victories and their failures. They are a treasure trove. Take a genuine interest in others. Just do a treasure hunt on that person that you've just met. There is so much there to learn and to discover. The research suggests that the people that you knew, outer rings of uh, connection can actually be the best sources of new job opportunities. There's all sorts of ways and all sorts of reasons to be connected with people and to go uh, develop a, a relationship with them, but it starts with this. Develop a genuine interest in other people. Two ways in which you can start developing that body language. Smile. Look at their face. Eye contact. Look at them when you're asking that question. Now, how is that, say, compared to... Yeah. You all right? You doing all right? Yeah, good. <laughs> so it's much better that I say, because it was Dan, wasn't it? I met you, Ben. Yeah, Dan, Ben, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> we met five minutes ago. Um, ben, hey, how are you doing? Good, right, so eye contact, friendliness, the amount of people for whom this is new actually is surprising. And actually we need to, these are basic skills. Smile, eye contact, focus on them. They are the ones who are most important in that moment in time. They are a treasure trove. They are a universe. You're about to go and explore that wonderful set of planets that are all interrelated. I know I'm pushing it a little bit too far, aren't I? <laughs> I do find people incredibly inspiring and incredibly amazing. And I think if we can just develop that, it really, really does help. And then as you're doing that, you then focus on active listening. Now, there's whole courses on this. We could spend months on it. But just some really big ones that can, you can use straight away. Minimal encourages. It's just when you simply nod when you're listening to somebody. And it's just there to let you know, that, let them know that you're really interested. Just... And then the other one is the kind of the, the, the quote, non-verbal encourager, which is, mm -hmm. hmm. Because it just communicates, I'm interested. Tell me more. All of those are basically saying, tell me more. Tell me your universe and tell me who lives in your planets. That's what I want to know. Notice emotions. <laughs> let me orbit and then let me land on your planet. <laughs> Reflect back to them. Oh, so it wasn't such a good weekend. Pick up on the emotions. You sound a bit perplexed about that. Are you, are you, is it perplexed? Just do those three things, and you will be friendship material. Then you can grow in the art of conversation. Three levels of questions here that you can use straight away. These are the persons that you meet perhaps in the park, you're walking your dog. You don't want to get too deep too quickly. We're not going to talk about planets and landing on them and uh, colonizing and anything like that. But this is just simply the, the, at the factual level, the who are they? And this is where you just want to simply be the person who is interested in where do they live? Are you local? Have you been here for very long? Gosh, it's Oxford. You could have moved here, you know, 10 minutes ago. Um, those kinds of basic questions. What are you doing for work? What's taking your time? Those kinds of questions. All of that is helping you to build commonality or find commonality. You like European quirky films too? Next level is when you are looking at what they love. So you're moving from facts to feelings and then you're asking questions that are a little bit more emotive. So it might be rather than just simply 
um, you know, how was your weekend or what was your weekend? Weekend, by the way, those basic questions, how are you, how was your weekend, are actually really, really good. Because what happens when you say, well, how was your weekend? What did you get up to? What do they do? They tell you about generally what they did with their hobbies. Ah, you've started to move to second two, uh, the, the second level, which is about what they love. And so it might be something along the lines of, um, well, you know, what would you really like to do on a weekend? What would your perfect weekend look like? What three things would it have? And that starts to reveal their loves. And then when there is time, when you have maybe had those 200 hours, you move to that third level, which is really when you're talking about their hurts and their hopes, their deepest dreams, the things that they wouldn't share with many people. And this is where perhaps you are able to get to a, pl a place of shared vulnerability and depth where they finally entrust to you their deepest hurts. Here's a guy that I reckon I've probably spent five years meeting with, walking our dog uh, at the local park. And over time, I don't think he's asked me much about myself at all. This is Agape. This is Agape. This is not moving to Philia. But over the time, he has shared things with me. And as I've been walking away when we said goodbye, he said, oh, just by the way, Sheridan, I haven't shared that with anybody else at all in the world. I'd just rather if you kept it to yourself. I said, absolutely. It's just between the two of us. He said, it's just this. This is what he said last time we saw each other. When I share these things with you, somehow it just seems to lighten the load. This guy's not a Christian. I've, t I've told him that I'm praying for him. Some of the decisions that he and his wife have had to make for all sorts of various reasons have been really, really tough. That's not philia, it's agape. But all the great philia begins with agape and keeps on moving. And maybe in time, it'll be reciprocated. Listen, people are a world, universe of interesting things to explore and to discover. And then play conversational ping pong. This makes probably a fair bit of sense just by itself. If you're dominating the conversation, you're not going to make a friendship. If you hijack a conversation, you're not going to make a friendship. You know what happens when somebody comes up and, hey, Sheridan, how are you? Oh, I got this really bad migraine headache. And they say, oh, that's really bad. Yeah, I'm not feeling too bad myself. And last time I had a, a migraine headache, it lasted for days. Um, in fact, we've had a history of migraine headaches actually throughout my whole family. Um, I heard once that they said about migraines, but anyway, gosh, I just feel ill today. I feel sick. Um, gosh, and COVID, gosh, I don't know if I, where we ever survived this thing. I just don't. And meanwhile, I've just collapsed <laughs> under the weight of my migraine, what do you do? You play conversational ping pong. That person has honored you and maybe you're sharing a little bit about, about you know, how you're doing or where you're at or whatever and you say, oh, anyway, enough about me. How are you doing? What's going on with your life? My friend DJ is great about this. He always wants to throw it back. Sometimes I've got to throw it back to him and then he throws it back to me and we've got a game of ping pong going on because we want to actually find out how each person is. But sometimes we can dominate conversations. After a little while, throw it back. Okay, questions before we move that. Makes sense. Any questions before we move on? Okay, I've got negative one minute to finish this. Activities. Uh, prioritize activities that uh, include time to talk. If you're going to have a cycling group, that's good. Why don't you incorporate a pub stop into it? So you've got not just the activity, but remember our three Rocket science ingredients are time, <laughs> talk, and activities. If you can incorporate something like that, you'll be doing really well. How about choosing regular activities over one-off events? If you want to develop relationships with people, um, going to a one-off book signing by an author, you might meet somebody. It's not a lot, really, to bring you back in contact with each other. But if you go to a monthly book club, you have something regular happening. If you get a chance, the other great seminar that was happening this afternoon was Christopher Neal's and what they were talking about, what they've done with Lighthouse and getting a bunch of 20-somethings together in a pub by just having an ongoing game of Dungeons and & Dragons. And because it's an ongoing game, it's repetitive, it's, re it's regular, and they stop it just at the cliffhanger each week and then everybody comes and, and goes and has a little bit of a chat and over time they're going to be able to uh, really be able to gospelize that space. Um, it's a regular meeting place and they're able to do such good things with it. Move towards a regular meetup in some kind of way. It might be a monthly phone call or something. Move towards regular activities and consider creating an intentional space. 
Friendship Lab will be helping you to do that if you want to do that. It'll actually provide a space in which you can have six sessions where you can say, we are going to get together in the same room for the very intentional purpose of building better friendships. Okay, church leaders, let me just end on this. Be encouraged. Your church is uniquely positioned to meet this need. It's one of the greatest needs of our age. And you are one of the two remaining institutions that brings people together. And if we can just be more intentional about getting those people in the same room, and I'm hoping the Friendship Lab course will help you to do that, then you will be in a very good position to, I think, really reach people that are ready to connect. Continue to create community, but with friendship as the goal, community is not enough. Community is wonderful. Community is the seedbed out of which friendship grows. But it's not enough. Most community will actually only reach that nascent friendship stage. What we then want to do is become intentional with helping people really to get, to get close to each other. And that takes a bit of work in its own right. Intentionally empower people with friend-making skills. I'm not suggesting that all of you go out and be friends to lonely people. Because actually, the research would suggest that you might actually be wrestling with the amount of time that you have available anyway. But if you intentionally empower people with friend-making skills, then you will be able to do some great work. And tend your own friendships. Research out of the United States says that 30% of church leaders have no close friends, echoing all of those figures we've said at the beginning. Why? Because you're so busy, focused on the outer rings, if you like, the, the outer levels of relationship. You're so busy. Keep some time, keep some energy to those very intentional, very close, those relationships that fill you up with the power and the energy and the joy to be able to go and do that agape love that you do. Okay, only three minutes over time. <laughs> All right, any final questions and then we'll wrap up. Otherwise, I'm here for at least another four or five minutes. Okay, thank you. It's been very helpful. Great. You got a question? No, out of, I mean, if you will know, that I, you know, my life has changed three years ago, and Eileen died. Just to back up this thing about tending friendships, um, because that is what's kept me going over the last three years, is being able to rediscover friendships that some of which I, I were waning. But it's, it's just it, it's that real last point was underlining. Even when you're busy, tend the friendships, even if they've been at a distance, because they then can pick them up, as you referred to earlier. Because you never know quite what's going to happen around the corner. I'll hang around if you want to talk. Um, do you want to ask this, ask this for everybody? Uh, no, so just because you showed the statistics with the UK, US, and uh, I don't know, Australia. So do you have any statistics which reflect countries like Middle East or Southeast Asia, which would match show different... That's what, yeah, so uh, because you, when you mentioned about community that creates friendship, and I think that's what I have re recognized the difference, having been brought up in all these places. So. I don't. I know that loneliness is not only a Western phenomenon, but I don't have specific... Uh, and if you can find me some, I'd like them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Class dismissed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>